the 38th lecture and we want to discuss cross correlation functions and their properties today. But before this, I want to review some of the properties of autocorrelation functions because as you will see <coughs> the properties, some properties of cross correlation are in drastic contrast or drastic uncertainty as compared to the autocorrelation function properties. If I recall what I did on autocorrelation, we had shown that R x sub 0 is equal to x squared bar. R x, well <coughs> as you will see later cross correlation functions do not have a relation like this. We also saw that R x of tau is R x of minus tau. This will also be defined by cross correlation and then we proved that R x of tau for non-zero tau shall be less than or equal to R x of 0. R x of 0 is always a positive quantity. R x of tau can be positive or negative, but the magnitude can never exceed R x of 0. And we showed that if R x of, if x of t has a DC component, then R x of tau also has a DC component and if this component is x0, then R x of tau has the DC component x0 squared. And then we showed that if R x, if x of t has a periodic component, has a periodic component of the form let us say A cosine omega t plus theta, where theta is the random variable, then, <coughs> then R x of tau has a DC as a periodic component with the same frequency whose amplitude is A squared by 2 and then this will be multiplied by cosine of omega tau. <coughs> I want your attention from that corner. All right. What we have not said last time is that if R x, if x of tau, x of t has no DC component or no periodic component. You see obviously if x of t has a DC component, then R x of tau shall always have x 0 squared, all right. In, in R x of tau there shall always be a non-zero component x 0 squared. If x of t has a periodic component, then it shall always have this periodic component in it irrespective of the value of tau. If x of t has no DC or periodic component, then it is true that x of R x of tau limit tau tends to infinity goes to what do you think it should go to? 0. Why? Because when tau is very large that is T 1 there should be no correlation. The similarity is if any is lost as tau increases and therefore this is a common sense from common sense argument it follows. It can also be proved rigorously which we shall not do here. This property is important that when tau <coughs> tau increases to very large values the uh, the autocorrelation coefficient tends to 0. We next consider how to measure the autocorrelation coefficient measurement of R x of tau. Obviously, the measurement of R x of tau requires a knowledge of the joint probability density function JPDF, which is usually not known in a given situation of communication. Uh, with random time functions or random time functions imposed in the form of noise on otherwise a deterministic process, you require a knowledge of JPDF which is usually not known and therefore what is done is either you establish that the process is ergodic or you assume that the process is 
approximately ergodic and then what you measure is Rx of t, Rx of tau that is the time autocorrelation function which as you know is given by limit t tends to infinity minus t to plus t 1 over 2 t yes x of t x of t plus tau dt. Now, how do you measure all right we agree that we cannot measure we cannot measure r x of tau because over the ensemble average because we do not have a knowledge of j p d f all right. So, what we say is we assume that the process is ergodic we establish we either establish or assume that the process is the random process is ergodic. So, that the time averages shall be the same as the ensemble averages. Now, in order to in order to be able to measure the time average, obviously the time interval that you have to consider is infinite. Now, you cannot go on measuring, uh, you cannot go on measure, measuring things over infinite period of time. So, necessarily, capital T has to be restricted. All right, capital T has to be finite. If you have to measure it, all right, capital T has to be finite. Then the question arises: you measure over an interval capital T, let us say 0 to capital T, what should be the value of tau? Obviously, tau is a finite quantity. In this definition, capital T goes to infinity, but tau is a finite quantity. Therefore, tau is always much less than capital T, where capital T goes to infinity. This property that tau is much less than capital T must also be true in the measurement in the actual measurement with capital T finite. In other words, tau must be very small compared to capital T only then the results shall have some similarity with the actual time autocorrelation coefficient. These are matters of approximation and life is in general a matter of approximation is not it. So, what you do is the following you measure R x of tau which is which is now look at the way uh, actual measurement convention is you measure from 0 not minus infinity you cannot go to minus infinity you cannot go to minus t either because in act in any actual measurement you start at a certain instant of time and measure over a certain interval. So, you go from 0 to not capital T, but T minus tau tau is specifically shown here this is a convention an IEEE established convention, but there is a there is a uh, a, a reason also and then you divide by t minus tau all right x of t x of t plus tau dt. In other words, if this is your interval 0 to capital T, then all that you can measure all that you can measure is uh, autocorrelation coefficient for a value of tau where tau is much less than capital T and in practice in practice for this measurement to reflect the autocorrelation coefficient tau is to t must be at least 1 is to 2000. If you want to measure tau for 1 millisecond your measurement interval must be about 2000 millisecond. Now, if the process is ergodic it is also stationary and therefore, it does not it does not matter where your time intervals are your t 1 could be here and t 1 plus tau could be here. What matters is the difference between the two samples x t and x t plus tau the time instant difference and this is the law that tau is to t should be it is a rule of thumb one has to obey this is to be at least about 1 is to 2000. You also know that <coughs> in practice we do not carry out integration that is we do not record the two waveforms and then multiply the two uh, point by point and then we cannot do that. What do we do? We discretize any integration that we have to do from practical waveforms we discretize that is what we do is this interval 0 to capital T <coughs> we break up into small intervals let us say uh, delta T 2 delta T and so on and suppose capital T is capital N delta T. <coughs> then the uh, autocorrelation function the time autocorrelation function at tau where tau is let us say 
n times delta t tau is n times delta t where small n is an is an integer is therefore measured not as an integration but as a average over a summation that is 1 by capital N minus small n this corresponds to capital T minus small t then summation x k x of k plus n for k going from 0 to capital N minus n this is the analog of the integration that I wanted to perform that is 1 by t minus tau integral from 0 to t minus tau and the product of the two this dt cancels with delta t that we shall have here n minus n delta t and this is the formula that is used for computation and it can always be programmed on a digital computer it is a very small uh, very elementary and trivial program. <coughs> Oh, what is the reason for the this is to bring into focus the fact that tau must be much less than capital T. If you only write <coughs> if you only write capital T and capital T here one may not remember this, but when you make tau T minus tau this <coughs> I am sorry I should bring it over here. When you write T minus tau you must remember that this must be approximately equal to capital T. This is only a reminder, a, a convention to. Uh, similarly, in the in the discrete computation also, this fact is put into effect. That is, small n, this integer, maybe one or two, then capital N must be about two thousand. If small n is two, the capital N must be four thousand. All right. Usually, capital N. If you are doing it with a digital computer with a do loop and going on accumulating, there is no problem. Capital N lies between 5000 and 10,000. And then small n typically never exceeds 50. That is, if you take 10,000 intervals, the tau at the most can be 50 times that interval. 5. Well, 5 to 10. All right depending on the number of samples 1 is to 2000 three no to three, to five. 3 to 5 2 to 5 3 becomes 6000 all right is that clear 1 is to 2000 is a kind of a thumb rule that one has to obey three to five. why 5000 becomes ah, it can be less than 2 less than 2, but you can be 3. If it is 3, then 3 times 2000 is 6000, which is greater than 5000. If 5000 is the number of samples, okay. Now, <clears throat> there is nothing sacred about it. You might even go to 3, but then your accuracy shall suffer. Finally, we come to cross correlation function. Now, <clears throat> the concepts would become a little more involved with cross correlation, because cross correlation function by definition is the correlation between samples taken from between random variables taken from two different processes that is let us say x1 is equal to x of t1 and y2 is equal to y of t1 plus tau and we assume that the two random variables are jointly stationary what does this mean? X1 and Y2 are jointly stationary. What does it mean? It means that the probability density function of X1 and Y2, the joint probability density function, in the autocorrelation also we require a joint PDF, isn't it? In cross correlation also we require a joint PDF. The only difference is that the two random variables are taken from two different processes. One is an x of t, the other is an ensemble of y of t. <coughs> and the joint probability density is denoted by p x1 y2. If the two processes are jointly stationary, then small p x1 y2 shall be independent of t1 that is right independent of well no, not necessarily t1 time origin let us say t0 which means that the correlation function 
<coughs> if we define the correlation function between x1 and x2, this shall be independent of t1, it shall only depend on tau. And therefore, we can define for this particular case of jointly stationary random variables, we can define R x y tau as the expected value of x of t and y of t plus tau, where the absolute the, the value of small t is unimportant, all right, which means that this is equal to uh, <coughs> x t y t plus tau p x y the probability density function multiplied by d x d y minus infinity to infinity <coughs> <coughs> minus infinity to infinity all right this is the definition of the cross correlation function between two random variables x and y. Obviously, yeah. So, what is the physical interpretation of cross correlation function? It is no more concrete than autocorrelation. It also determines the same thing that is how close or how similar y2 is to x, x1. Instead, we can take as y of t instead of taking y of t plus tau. Oh, the, at the same instant of time, yeah, <coughs> we will consider that also. That obviously is a special case of this. That would be R x y of 0, all right. Yeah, we can do that also. This is more general, okay. Obviously now, if I interchange x and y, if I interchange x and y, that is y x tau, let us see what the definition is. This would be minus infinity to infinity minus infinity to infinity y of t x of t plus tau p now comes the question the probability density function may not be the same p x y may not be the same as p y x they may not be the same unless the two random variables are statistically independent of each other. We will, pardon me? Why not same? Why not same? The probability density function of the joint occurrence of x and y, where x. So, what is the difference between px, y, and py? They are the same thing, This is not the same thing. <laughs> they are different. <coughs> All right. We will we'll come to why they are different a little later. All right, p y x d x d y. If these are not the same, if p x y and p y x are different, then obviously r x y tau and r y x tau are not necessarily equal. r x y tau is not necessarily equal to r y x of tau. In fact, we will establish uh, remarkably uh, surprising relationships between the two a little later. The probability density functions are not generally and not necessarily equal. P x1 y2 is not necessarily equal to P y1 x2. We will come to this a little later. Similarly, similarly for the time cross correlation functions, we can have ensemble cross correlation functions over the ensemble. We can have time cross correlation functions also, that is we can define R x y tau as equal to 1 over 2 t integral minus infinity, no, minus t to plus t, minus t to plus t, x t y t plus tau d tau, limit t tends to infinity, all right, exactly like the time autocorrelation function. We can also define R y x tau as limit t tends to infinity 1 by 2 t integral minus t to t. Now, we can take y t x of t plus tau d tau <coughs> and in general these two are not equal either. R x y tau is not equal to R y x tau, but for jointly 
ergodic process, if the two random variables are jointly ergodic, then the time autocorrelation will be the same as cross correlation. That is, R x y tau is equal to R x y tau, and similar is the case if the subscripts are interchanged. That is, if this is made y x, then this should also be made y x. All right, is the definition clear? The reason why the probability density functions are not identical shall be clear later <coughs> as we go ahead with the derivation. Can I go to the next term? Well, we discuss some properties and you will see that these properties are quite different from those of the autocorrelation function. For example, R x y 0 as Pankaj pointed out, what is the relation between R x y 0 and R y x 0? Are they equal or no, not equal? They are equal because x t expected value of the product x t and y t. All right, they are equal. In the in the autocorrelation case, this had the physical significance of mean squared value, mean squared value over the ensemble. Here, there is no physical significance, no particular physical significance. The only thing we know is that the changing of the subscripts does not change the value no particular physical significance. What can you say about this R x y tau and R x y minus tau? If you take if you take the definition, let me go back to the definition. This is R x y tau. If I change tau to minus tau, then I shall have x t and y t minus tau. Or y x tau. Pardon me? Are they equal? R x y tau and R x y minus tau? No. no, they are not equal. Okay. So, they are not in general equal. And therefore, R x y tau necessarily. They are not necessarily equal. And therefore, R x y tau, unless R x tau, is not necessarily an even function of tau. All right. In the in the autocorrelation case, it was an even function. A remarkable property is that R x y tau is the expected value of x, let's say t one, y t one plus tau. All right. Now suppose I take the expected value of x t1 minus tau, all right, I change the time uh, reference so that t1 now becomes t1 minus tau, then y, argument of y shall be simply t1. Don't you see that this is the same as the expected value of y t1 times x t1 minus tau, which means that it is equal to r y x of minus tau. Now, this change, this change, should it affect the cross correlation function? Should it affect the expectation? If the two processes are jointly stationary, obviously a change of time reference should not affect and therefore, this must be equal, which establishes the property that R x y tau is equal to R y x of minus tau. Can you see now why the probability density functions are different? What is the common link between them? It is Pxy and Pyx. If these two, if Pxy and Pyx were equal, obviously for joint stationarity, the two cross correlation functions should also have been equal. There is nothing else in them. Isn't that right? On the other hand, we prove. You have xt and yt plus tau, on the other hand, you have yt and xt plus tau. Sir, in one case, yt is delayed and yt. If you look at the time correlation function, then we get to. Then we? Appreciate, we can appreciate it in a better way. Even here, we are assuming that the two probability density functions are the same. Same. We don't have any p function in the time domain, in the time correlation function. Yes, that is correct. So? Even then, we get this result. Which result? R x y tau is equal to R minus 
Or y y x to minus 2, yeah. Mm. If the processes are jointly ergodic, then we can replace this by time autocorrelation. But this is an indirect argument. I have not, this is not a direct argument. Time autocorrelation functions are different. That means p x y and p y x are different. That is it. Well, we'll continue this agony uh, for a little while more. Why they are different? <coughs> then r x y tau. You remember that r x of tau was maximum when the argument was zero. That is, r x of zero was the maximum value of r x of tau. Here, um, r x of R x y of tau is not necessarily maximum at tau equal to 0, but it is true that R x y tau, but it can be shown, we are not proving this, it can be shown that R x y tau mod is less than equal to square root of R x of 0 and R y of 0. That is, if you take the uh, mean squared value of the uh, of the individual processes, multiply them out, all right, take the square root, then this is greater than or equal to this. But the maximum, obviously, this is the maximum value, all right. The maximum value does not necessarily occur at tau equal to zero, all right. Maximum value is this. Our x y of tau is always less than this. Similarly, our y x of tau. Will it necessarily reach this value? Will it necessarily reach this value? Yes, it will. It will reach this value. The maximum does not necessarily occur at tau equal to 0, but the maximum value is this. This is why less than equal to. All right. <coughs> now, if x1 and x2, if x1 and y2 are statistically independent, Then obviously, R x y tau would be equal to, which is the expected value of x 1, y 2. If x 1 and y 2 are statistically independent of each other, then obviously, this will be E x 1 multiplied by E y 2. That means, it will be simply x bar and y bar. And you see, it does not matter whether I take x first or y first and therefore it will be the same as r y x of tau all right and the more interesting thing is that if one of the processes is a zero mean process all right then r x y tau shall be identically equal to zero for all values of tau this never happens with uh, autocorrelation, all right. If one of the processes, for statistically independent processes, if one of them is zero mean, one or both, one suffices, then R x y tau, that is the cross correlation coefficient is absolutely zero. What does it mean? That the two waveforms of x of t and y of t are absolutely dissimilar, they are perfectly uncorrelated. Question is now, is the reverse true? Suppose, suppose I have R x y tau equals to 0 and in addition x bar is equal to 0. Does this imply that x 1 and y 2 are statistically independent? In general, the answer is no. The answer is no. One must be very careful. One can get trapped in this uh, in this kind of an argument. You see, this is only if statement, not only if. In other words, R x y tau, if x1 and y2 are statistically independent, then R x y tau is R y x tau is the product of the two mean values, mean values over the ensemble. But, but if this is 0 and one of them is 0, the R x1 and y2 are not necessarily statistically independent of each other. A counter example perhaps we shall construct during the tutorials. We next consider <coughs> sums of random processes, that is random processes which are generated by linear combination 
of two or more random processes. All right. For example, if we have a random process, let's say um, x and y, two random processes, then we can generate a third random process as a linear combination, maybe sum of the two or difference between the two. So, we can have x plus minus y. This can be my third random process, new random process z. Then it makes sense to talk about the autocorrelation coefficient of z. Right? We are creating a third, we are creating a single random process out of two. It can be extended to more than two, that we shall consider later. But if we consider a random process z, which is derived as a linear combination of x and y, all right, we have taken the simplest linear combination. In general, it could be alpha x plus beta, alpha x plus beta y, where alpha and beta can take any values, all right. Let us consider the simplest, simplest one, which is the sum of the two or the difference between the two. And let us define, let us define two random variables, z1, which is z t1, which is x of t1 plus minus y of t1, and another random variable z2 from the same process, which is z of t1 plus tau, which is x of t1 plus tau plus minus y of t1 plus tau. <coughs> All right. Then it makes sense to talk about the autocorrelation coefficient of z, the autocorrelation coefficient of x, the autocorrelation coefficient of y, then the cross correlation coefficient of x and y. There are two of them, r x y and r y x of tau. All right. What we would like to know is what is the relationship between all these five quantities. And it's very simple to derive this. Let us see. R z of t, R z of tau, the autocorrelation coefficient of the process z is the expected value of z1 multiplied by z2, which is the expected value of x t1 plus minus x y t1 multiplied by running out of brackets, x of t1 plus tau plus minus y of t1 plus tau. And if you cross multiply, you see that x t1, when it multiplies x t1 plus tau, the expected value shall be simply rx of tau. Is that clear? When this multiplies this, 2x's, you simply get rx tau. Then when plus minus y t1 multiplies plus minus y t1 plus tau, the sign is plus, plus into plus makes plus, minus into minus makes plus, and then what you get, the expected value is simply r y of tau, all right. Then when x t1 multiplies y t1 plus tau, what do you get? r x y tau with a plus minus sign. If this is plus, then the product is plus. If this is minus, then the product is minus. And similarly, when y t1 multiplies x t1 plus tau, you get plus minus r y x tau. All right. Now, this formula, you see that the autocorrelation of the z, the third random process, new random process, is the sum of the autocorrelation functions of the individual random processes plus algebraic sum of, of all the cross correlation coefficients and this is in general true. That is, if z equal to let us say, uh, <coughs> how do I denote this? Okay, I will say x uh, a, uh, x b and so on and so on that is the number of random processes, then r z tau is the sum of all autocorrelation functions, all SEFs plus sum of all cross correlation functions, CCFs plus minus. plus minus. This has to be the algebraic sum. Okay? This in general is true. What we prove for by taking two functions, 
now could be extended to multiple number of functions and you can also now introduce the scaling factors if you so desire you can say alpha a alpha b and so on this will reflect in the corresponding additions of cross correlation and autocorrelation functions and this is an important this is a very important application and this this is what we shall talk about now a very important application suppose you have very large noise very large noise and a very tiny signal and the signal is periodic okay so what you have is a signal x of t which is of the form a cosine of omega t plus theta where theta is a random variable all right theta is a random variable distributed uniformly over the interval 0 to 2 pi as usual in other words x of t is a deterministic random process and it is mixed with a noise y of t let us say n of t no let us consider it y of t y of t is noise y of t <coughs> and x of t and y of t are uncorrelated this is quite uh, simple they are usually so x of t is a tiny sinusoidal signal immersed in an ocean of noise let us say uh, you know what is rx t rx tau if x of t is a periodic function like this what is rx tau a square by 2, squared by two cos omega tau. cosine omega tau All right. y of t the noise component usually the autocorrelation function of noise r y tau usually it decays with tau in other words and this decay can be modeled very um, accurately by an exponential process all right let us consider that this is of the form let us say y 0 squared let us say uh, e to the power minus some constant alpha mod tau that is tau positive or negative it does not matter it decays exponentially. <coughs> now if I mix these two processes which means that I have a signal z of t I have a random process z of t which is x of t plus y of t then we have created a new random process and z of t which consists of a superposition of the desired signal a cosine omega t plus theta it is a random process because theta is a random variable and y t is noise wide band noise then the problem in communication is to recover the signal from the noise and if the signal is immersed in noise no amplification or filtering can recover the signal but you see taking autocorrelation taking autocorrelation will indeed recover because you know r z tau the, the, the autocorrelation of the third process will now be simply equal to r x tau plus r y tau we have assumed that x and y are statistically un, statistically independent of each other that is they are uncorrelated usually that is so a wide band noise it is nothing no correlation with the given signal and therefore it is simply the sum of the two if you plot this versus tau we have assumed that y0 squared is much greater than s squared by 2 that is we have assumed that the signal is a tiny one immersed in an ocean of noise and therefore y0 squared is much greater than s squared by 2 now if you if you plot this how do you measure this how do you measure the autocorrelation function well all you do is take a sample a large enough large enough interval 0 to capital T then take a small tau small tau which is much less than capital T the usual process that we have we have discussed and then discretize the interval take the uh, amplitudes and multiply and so on that is you measure the time autocorrelation function and if you plot this versus tau obviously when tau is uh, very small tau is nearly equal to 0 it is the r y of t which will dominate even though even though well not even though 
R y of tau shall dominate and therefore you will get something like this. You see if you plot R y of t it would be something like this R y of tau all right and on this shall be superimposed this tiny periodic variation R x of tau is simply equal to s squared by 2 cosine of omega tau. So what you will get is something like this okay and then like this. So if you go sufficiently away from tau equal to 0 let us say 2000 times tau that is if you observe the autocorrelation over a large enough interval then ultimately you shall be able to see the periodic the periodicity and all that you need from here all that you need is to determine the amplitude and even the amplitude is not important all that you need is the frequency that is omega. If you know the frequency then obviously your autocorrelation is of the form cosine omega tau or sine omega tau it does not matter. All that you wish to wish to recover is this information that what are the frequencies contained and this shall be true even if you do not have one single sinusoidal component. Suppose you have many that is you have a spectrum the signal as I have told you many times a single sinusoid is useless for the purpose of communication. It carries no information unless it is modulated. Now any modulation will introduce a band of frequencies that is a spectrum, a band of frequencies and you have to have a band to be able to communicate, to be able to uh, communicate from one place to another any piece of information and therefore if X of T contain several frequencies or a, a small band of frequencies well this band the components can be recovered can be detected if you observe the autocorrelation function of the new process well it is not the new process this is what you receive z of t is what you receive at the receiver and you can recover the signal the tiny signal from the ocean of noise this was not otherwise possible by filtering what do you filter if the noise dominates then the noise the signal is not detectable at all. There was a <coughs> I am particularly impressed by this because it has it has many applications in, in communication and uh, and one of the PhD thesis that was written here in uh, communications was uh, uh, to was precisely this to recover a tiny signal from a noise tiny signal from uh, a signal plus noise and he had uh, uh, made the hardware for this and beautifully demonstrated how it can be done. Of course the, the what his innovation was in the process of taking the autocorrelation. He had uh, he had done this in a discrete manner but using a, a very innovative concept he used some simple differentiators for the purpose but that is beyond the scope of this, uh, this course. The point that I want to mention is that unless you introduce the concept of correlation here, uh, it, this could not be. This is one of the remarkable applications of correlation. <coughs> All right. The uh, next topic in the logical sequence would be uh, would be to see if random functions could be dealt with in the frequency domain. You know, in the in the uh, usual functions we have seen that uh, that Laplace transform or Fourier transform makes things very easy convolution becomes multiplication convolution the time domain becomes multiplication of the frequency domain and all that we have talked so far is in the time domain Rx of t Rx of tau uh, time autocorrelation function cross correlation function they are all in the time domain the question is can we do anything in the frequency domain of this. You see one of the difficulties is that a random time function we are not guaranteed that it shall be absolutely integrable. It extends from minus infinity to plus infinity and any uh, integral that you take it is not guaranteed that it shall be less than infinity. Even if you guarantee this for one sample function you do not know whether it will be valid for other sample functions or not. All right? And therefore you cannot take the Fourier transform. Fourier transform one of the conditions is that it must be absolutely integrable. The other condition is that its energy 
it's either a finite energy or finite power. The other condition is that its energy is uh, finite. Can you guarantee that? You cannot. You cannot guarantee because its function is random. It is unpredictable and it extends from minus infinity to plus infinity. So what do you do to be able to transform? On the other hand, we are very tempted because of our experience with uh, non-random time functions. We are very tempted if we could bring it to the, to the frequency domain. So the only thing that we do is if I have an infinite length of rope, all right, and I want to see, uh, I want to at least estimate its properties. What do I do? I my uh, field of vision is limited. I cannot see infinity from minus infinity to plus infinity at one go. So what do I do? I take a part of the rope. All right. If somebody wants to sample the IIT students. Well, he cannot go and interview 1300 students. What, what he does, what, what he does is he takes uh, several uh, representative samples from, let's say, 205, takes some from 344 and so on and so forth. So sampling. Here also we do the same thing. This is an artifice that we do. That is, we have the time function from minus infinity to plus infinity. We allow this time function to go through a window, a finite window from let us say 0 to capital T. And then since the function has now become limited in time, it is possible to satisfy the Fourier transformability condition, all right, a finite time signal, not necessarily because there must, there might be infinite number of infinite discontinuities. So we say that within the window, the time function is well behaved. We assume and then and then we allow capital T to go to infinity. That is after taking the Fourier transform, we allow capital T to go to infinity. No, we cannot. As soon as you do that, we violate the condition of existence of Fourier transform. But what we assume is that the, the random time functions are always judged in terms of their statistical averages, that is expectations, all right. So one is Fourier transform of the window, of the window time function, which integrates things from minus infinity to plus infinity, integrates with respect to t, and the expectation integrates over the ensemble, right. What we do is, we first take, now listen to this carefully, this is an artifice that we employ, but it does give results. So, for an engineer, whatever works is wonderful, all right. We do not care if it has violated some of the fundamental principles or not, if it works. What we do is, the process basically is, we cannot take Fourier transform of a random time function because Fourier transformability is not guaranteed. We guarantee this by passing the time function through a window. In other words, we take a sample a very long thing, we take a sample of it. And then what we do is, we Fourier transform this and also take the expectation. And then we interchange the operations. Expectation is over ensemble and integration is over time in taking Fourier transform. So we first take the expectation and then take the Fourier transform. You understand what I mean? In the process, you will see that it is possible to get a meaningful quantity in the frequency domain. Obviously not the spectrum because Fourier transform x of t does not exist. What we can obtain is an expression for spectrum density. You remember Percival's theorem, integral 1 by 2 pi, integral x of omega mag magnitude squared d omega and x of omega squared was spectral density. We will see next time tomorrow that it is useful, it is possible to introduce the concept of spectral density in the context of random time functions also. That is all for today.